Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nicole Siegel, and I am the Senior Education Communications Manager here at Third Way. We are delighted to have you join us today for a conversation with three incredibly impressive education journalists, Danielle Douglas-Gabriel of the Washington Post, Alyssa Nadworny of NPR, and Lindsay Ellis of the Chronicle of Higher Education. This is the fourth conversation in a series of conversations the Third Way Education team will be hosting over the next few months, in which we will engage influencers and thought leaders in the conversations happening around higher education and the federal response to coronavirus. The previous conversations with Congresswoman Donna Shalala, President of UMBC, Dr. Freeman Hrabowski, and Angie Kiefler, Strategic Consultant and Pollster are all available to view on our website. I think we can all agree higher ed looks completely differently, different now than it did just six months ago. The impact of coronavirus, systemic racism, a suffering economy, and a forthcoming presidential election have all exposed numerous fault lines in our nation's higher ed system and in students' livelihoods. So how do journalists keep up when there's almost too much news to print? And what's it like reporting on higher education during a global pandemic? Today, we're excited to go behind the story to dig into those questions and more. Before we formally kick off the conversation, a few logistical details regarding today's run of show. First, the hope is for everyone on today's call to have the opportunity to ask questions, which you can do using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'll go through a few questions of my own first and we'll save plenty of time at the end for audience Q&A. I also want to note that this conversation is on the record and is being recorded. So if there are things you miss or will want to reference again, you will be able to do so at a link that will be posted on Third Way's website. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our three incredible featured speakers for today's conversation. Danielle Douglas-Gabriel is a reporter for the Washington Post. She joined the Post in 2010, covering consumer-related business in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area, and joined the National Economy Desk in 2012, where she covered national and international banking, and for the last six years has focused on issues related to student debt, writing about the financial lives of students from when they first take out student loans all the way through their experiences in the job market. She's the recipient of fellowships from the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute and Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Next, we have Alyssa Nadworny, who covers higher education and college access for NPR. She's led the NPR Ed Team's multi-platform storytelling, incorporating radio, print, comics, photojournalism, and video into the coverage of education. In 2017, that work won an Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Innovation. And in case her voice sounds familiar, this is because she is also a host of NPR's Life Kit podcast, helping students navigate the college process. Um, last but not least, Lindsay Ellis is a senior reporter at the Chronicle of Higher Education, where she covers research universities. Her stories have addressed change, cooperation with business, research security, and crisis management. She joined the Chronicle after reporting on Texas higher education issues for the Houston Chronicle, where she was part of a team that won an Associated Press Media Editor's Grand Prize and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage of Hurricane Harvey. So as you can see, there are few better equipped to have this conversation than these superstar women whom I rely on as my most trusted news sources. So let's jump right in. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Let's not sugarcoat it. Journalists have a tough job. It's your responsibility to gather information and present the news in an honest and balanced way. And while ethical standards should not change, regardless of the type of story you're producing, these are unprecedented times. Hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives in the US alone due to coronavirus. The nation is staring down the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. There's widespread uncertainty over schools reopening in the fall. We're experiencing a long overdue reawakening of efforts to fight systemic racism. And let's not forget, we're three months away from arguably the highest stakes presidential election of our lifetime. So at a time when the world is on fire, 
how do you keep your emotions and opinions out of your reporting? Danielle, you want to kick us off? I was hoping you weren't going to pick on me. No, just <laughs> no it's fine. No, I, you know, I, I try to focus on what I consider to be the mission of my coverage, which is to help people navigate the cost of higher education. And that doesn't change no matter what. In fact, perhaps it becomes more intense in, in these sorts of situations because of all of the economic uncertainty and struggle. You know, it's never easy reporting on any kind of human suffering or struggle, but I try to be fair and balanced in telling these stories because I want to be respectful to not only the people who are sharing them, but also to my audience who are willing to read them. Lindsay? Yeah, I, um, I think probably the thing that has been most helpful for me is just try and build it in time whenever I can. And it's a fast moving new news environment. So sometimes that's hard, but, you know, trying to make sure that I have a little bit of extra time at the end of the reporting process or at the end of the writing process um, to call back the people I need any sort of clarification on, to take a fresh look at the data, um, to do another round of fact checking. I think that space you know, allows me as a reporter to, you know, have another level of a gut check um, about, you know, your own um, thoughts on an issue. And I think to um, the clear headedness of, of reminding yourself of, you know, the stakes of getting something right um, in a moment of such high pressure, I think, I think that is, is needs to be so clear. Thank you. And I think Alyssa is having a little bit of tech issues, but if she can hear us and we can hear her, then she can answer. Alyssa, if you're there, we the question posed is, um, oh, I think she's gone. Okay, so we will. I will move on to the next question and we can loop her in when she's back. Um, so a related question, what are some of the unanticipated challenges you've faced investigating a story during a global pandemic? And whoever wants to go first should feel free. Um, I think in, in the last few months, you know, offices for public records requests, those being closed or delayed, that's been a little bit of an impediment. Um, I think it's also with, with so much going on, um, other people's time, you know, those who I might rely on for interviews or, um, you know, the people navigating this are also navigating childcare issues and, you know, their own employment issues and, you know, trying to be so respectful of, of their time as I report out a story. I think everybody's going through it and, and that can be sort of an impediment as well. I've, I've found some, um, some kind of uh, commonalities with folks who are having childcare trouble and, and actually having to schedule my own interviews around my toddler's nap times and telling people that and just being upfront with them. They tell me about their own problems and we kind of share uh, camaraderie around uh, that experience and that's that's been helpful in when it is difficult to to get folks uh, as to be as responsive as they previously were before the pandemic um, you know I think also a part of it is at the beginning it wasn't as easy as it always is to reach out to find people folks were still trying to figure out their own personal situations as well as just kind of teleworking and not everyone quite having the opportunity to do so really quickly and in a great way. So that's mainly smoothed itself out at this point. So it's not as challenging to, to get, it, get people on the phone or get the sorts of records that I need for my stories. Thank you. Um, the irony that Alyssa is experiencing tech difficulties this question, during this question is not lost on me. So Alyssa, what are some of the unanticipated challenges you faced investigating a story during a global pandemic? <laughs> well, definitely connection. I mean, one of the things that I've been trying to do is um, just to constantly have kind of um, calls and check-ins with students and higher ed leaders throughout this process, kind of regardless of what the story is, just because I feel so out of it and isolated, like just in front of my computer, where I spend most of my days now. And so, but even just that is like the challenge of connection, even with people who seemingly have good internet, like I thought I did. I mean, it's just, that's been a, a major issue of just kind of trying to connect in certain, certain places and, and certain ways especially with radio, because of course I'm trying to get audio. 
Yeah. Um, and, and we've gotten so used, this is like kind of a, an, an aside, but we've gotten so used to just talking at a computer, which is actually pretty terrible audio because it's like so echoey and in a room. And so people think like, oh, no, no, I got this because I do Zoom all the time. <laughs> so it feels like a, another like layer of education around like, well, actually you have to have like, the phone by your ear. And well, you have the, the innovation of your um, radio studio in a closet, which um, anyone who attended Education Writers Association conference last week got to see a little tour of. Which yeah, I love. It seems like we're all in each other's homes in such an intimate way during this time, which in some ways is awesome for reporting because it's kind of a glimpse on video chat that I may never have gotten with a phone call, but it's also very personal. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, some colleges announced their fall reopening plans as early as April, which potentially was a mistake. Um, during such uncertain times, it's hard to plan what's going to happen in the next few days, let alone the next few months. As such, we've, see, we've started to see many, many, many colleges that initially planned to physically open their campuses come fall, reverse their original plans and move to online only instruction or a hybrid scenario. Um, and thanks to a partnership between the Chronicle of Higher Ed and the College Crisis Initiative out of Davidson College, you too can follow along um, and track colleges evolving plans on their website. Um, so I think I know the answer to this question, but would love to hear it from you all. Uh, do you think we'll see more schools changing course in the next few minutes, in the next few days? And if so, why? What are the, what are the variables um, that are being considered when making those decisions? Anyone that wants to go first should feel free. Danielle? So oh, definitely. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's no way that schools can, can stay, stay on the path of having in-person classes if there are uh, spike in infections, if there are outbreaks, plus if their governor or local, or local leader says, hey, we need you to quarantine, hey, we need you to shut down, they have no choice but to do so. I mean, it certainly is going to be more pressure on their bottom line as they try to pivot and make these decisions, but their hands are, are tied in these decisions. One thing that I've been um, keeping my eye on is just the rationale that college leaders give when they say that they're going to reverse plans. And I think it partly is attributed to local regulations. I think just these testing capacities, um, which has been sort of the backbone of a lot of college reopening plans, um, we're seeing that that's really complicated to pull off. And um, one campus two weeks ago, um, in their announcing to reverse plans, they basically just realized that it was taking more than a week to get tasks back and you couldn't effectively contact Trace with that. I think something that we've started to see a little bit more um, is campuses when they're changing their plans are saying, you know, we'll start the semester online and we'll see sort of what happens after that. Um, I think one thing that I'm going to be watching is like, where do those dates go? Um, and how do those evolve over time as well? Yeah, and same, same with everybody else. Um, I, you know, it's been pretty amazing to watch like every day. I feel like we have new announcements. You, you turn away from, from the computer for like a minute and like three more colleges have, have announced. Definitely watching the test and catastrophe thing. I mean, What's been really interesting for me is that kind of at the beginning of this, a lot of the really kind of larger research universities, which actually potentially have the capacity to test, um, you know, we were kind of keeping our eye on that to see, oh, maybe this is modeling after other countries. Like maybe they can do it in the sense that they are kind of doing the things that we know you need to do. Contact tracing, isolation, mass testing, surveillance testing. And so it's been interesting to kind of see like, okay, they actually have the resources and maybe the framework to do it. And then these smaller schools, which actually potentially have the real possibility to do it because they have maybe isolated campuses or fewer students, but those two are not like synced up. Um, that's been something that I've kind of kept my eye on. I wish, I, not I wish, but I, I was interested to see given kind of the frameworks that we've seen in other countries work, could we pull this off? Could we, could we do something that maybe cities and regions haven't done that we could do on the college campus? And I find like the more we get closer and closer to the start dates, they're just not willing to, to do that experiment. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do wonder though, your, your smaller campuses, like say a sweet bar, briar in Virginia, this is a very rural kind of campus. They can do the social distancing. They can do all those things. Those things. I don't necessarily know if they have the resources to do a lot of testing the way that some of the more well-heeled schools can, but that would be an interesting experiment to see if a school like that with that much space, that much um, that to, to kind of adhere to all the CDC guidelines could pull it off. And if I remember correctly, I think it was Sweetbriar that had on its website, like we have the space to pull this off. Um, and because <laughs> their enrollment numbers um, were lower, that they basically were kind of spinning that as a positive of, you know, we could keep people distant. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, go ahead, Alyssa. And well, I was just going to say, I mean, I've been, that tracker that you mentioned has been amazing. I'm so glad they're doing the partnership with the Chronicle, the um, College Crisis Initiative. Um, yeah. But, awesome. you know, there still are many schools that have yet to announce they're going online. So we're kind of in this moment in which maybe we will see some, maybe we will see some move-in dates. I think some of the move-in dates are like in two weeks, maybe a week and a half. So we're kind of getting down to the wire in which maybe just by default or just by timeline, we will start to see what that looks like. Yeah, so um, a couple of you mentioned it in your, in your response to that question, but there are certainly not all institutions of higher ed are created equal, whether it's their size, their endowment, funding, resources, et cetera, et cetera. So as you've been learning about school's plans for the fall semester, do any examples come to mind of what you would kind of deem as resourceful strategies that schools are planning to implement to help meet the needs of their students. Anything? <laughs> well, um, you know, oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alyssa. Well, I was just going to say, you know, we have seen kind of some of these middle sized schools look at kind of the pods of keeping students in units. I think one in Vermont comes to mind. I, I can't remember the school. But kind of basically keeping students not only academically but socially in these sort of pods. Um, it's similar to like the block scheduling model that I know a lot of schools were looking at earlier this summer. Um, so that's, that could be interesting. I mean, I'm certainly interested in the schools that have the capability to do mass testing to see how that plays out. Um, you know, we're actually already seeing that, like U UC San Diego is doing that for students that were on campus in the summer. Um, so those are kind of the two things that I've been looking at, the pods, and then when we are testing surveillance by how does that look? So I, something very simple that I've noticed a couple of um, larger universities doing is having professors reach out to students ahead of time to make sure they have everything that they need, whether uh, to make sure that they can thrive in class. And it, I mean, it's a bit of a high touch model that some smaller schools have done for years, but more universities are asking faculty to take this extra step to ensure a smooth transition in the fall. And, you know, this is probably increasing the workload of faculty uh, right before school starts, but it is a smart way to identify problems rather than wait for them to emerge during the semester. So if there's a student who has learning disabilities that makes online a bit more challenging, you know that ahead of time, you can take care of it, try to figure out how to connect them with resources. If there's a student who's having issues with their technology, this is another way to make sure that you can connect them with the right resources. So it feels like a lot of schools are seeing the value even more so than they pr previously did in making sure that faculty is integrated into all of the resources that are available on campus and can direct students to them if needed before they get to camp, before the semester starts, so that they're not having problems in the first couple of weeks. And that just seems like a simple, easy thing that pretty much any school could do. Again, it requires a lot more work, but it is something I'm hearing a lot more of uh, at different campuses where I've interviewed faculty. Yeah, I think if anything, this kind of moment really shows the disparities in, in resources between institutions who can pull off that scale of testing and contact tracing and keep, keeping sort of different modalities of instruction at once and, and who just isn't able to do that. Um, I think, yeah, I've, I've seen similarly, you know, institutions kind of getting professors, but also administrative staff and even staff who, you know, might not 
have as much to do when students aren't on campus, but ha deploying those um, employees to check in with students more regularly and call people in advance of the fall. Um, that's, that's definitely something I've seen as well. One other thing that's been kind of interesting to see is how many schools kind of acknowledge what they learned in the spring from going online. I feel like all summer we were kind of caught up in this, what new things are we going to do for fall in person? And so another thing that's been really telling is when schools kind of admit things that didn't work out in the spring and that they're changing them for fall, knowing that they might be online or yeah. they're now announcing they're going to be online. So I've been keeping an eye out for that kind of stuff. I get the sense that a lot of the schools that were planning to be online for the fall are the ones who are going to succeed the most come the fall. The ones who are having to quickly pivot may have some struggles. Those who are looking at what happened in the spring and lessons that they could learn to better implement a fall lesson plan, I think are going to do well. And you're actually also already seeing a lot of universities hiring training managers to make sure that all faculty are at the same level in their ability to teach online and know the most uh, up-to-date digital tools are being creative in how they deliver their classes. And I think, I wonder if some of this has to do with uh, schools making the, the, uh, the say that we're not discounting your tuition. So <laughs> make sure you're getting as good an education, if not better, um, this fall online. Time will tell, time will tell, thank you. Um, so I wanna shift a little bit and um, move from talking about higher ed response to one health pandemic to another, uh, systemic racism. The killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor resulted in a racial reckoning in America, leading to Black Lives Matter protests nationwide, the biggest activist movement in history. And as with most modern social movements, young activists are leading the way. It's clear they're demanding their colleges and universities join in the good fight. So what actions have you seen institutions take in response to pressures from their students to fight racism on campus? I think um, one thing that we've seen this summer pretty widely is uh, renewed attention to building names and program names and the like. Um, I think to a lot of student activists, that's pretty low hanging fruit um, and doesn't really address sort of the broader structural inequities that are baked into um, the system that exists right now. Um, I think one thing that um, I've been wondering is, is what, you know, an online like very social activist semester looks like and how students and professors pursue that. Um, I think also taking a look at what scholarships, what um, admissions policies, what hiring policies change um, sort of outside of the more, you know, surface level renamings and, and the like that we've seen so far. I think it'll be interesting to see if some of the initiatives that universities say that they, they want to engage in, like, for instance, increasing uh, ethnic studies on campuses, um, making that mandatory in some places that's been under consideration, but whether they'll be able to implement it, especially at state schools where they're facing budget cuts or um, potential shortfalls uh, this, this fall or this year, how will they be able to actually meet the demands of students in a meaningful way if they aren't sure if they'll be able to meet the basic needs of you know faculty and staff by not having to furlough them or not having to do pay cuts or, or the like so there will be that tension of saying that you want to do all these great things but actually having the resources to make it happen yeah i think absolutely one of the biggest things will be kind of following the budgets and what they what colleges decide to spend money on especially in this moment um with projected enrollment down and and just money going out and not coming in um that's kind of where i think you'll actually see like the action of it um the student, the student activists that i've talked to it's like kind of they go both ways because i think many are very frustrated they won't be able to be on campus because that's where they do a lot of organization um, and connection and yet they've actually had a great success of connecting like in group chats and um, facebook groups and so it's kind of interesting that and it'll be very interesting to watch in the fall if that momentum keeps going and if those connections continue to be made and to push for change. Okay. 
Uh, I think you probably all agree. There are almost too many stories to tell these days. And assuming your editors provide you with some level of autonomy over what you write about, how do you decide which stories to give a voice to? Are you gonna make me call on one of you? Lindsay, you go first. <laughs> um yeah i mean i think there there are a lot of stories and so much news happening now um i think the stories that i feel most attracted to are the ones that like analyze and dig into systems i think that's just naturally how i think um i like to sort of suss out how structures work who they work for who they fail um, I think I've been drawn in in this moment to the stories that can can dig into that, and you know that that's as it relates to racial justice, as it relates to COVID, and for finances and and leadership. Um, and I think finding um, just understanding the systems that sort of govern this whole higher ed um, system is has been really interesting to me. I, for, for me, I, uh, I really am interested in accountability stories, uh, and, and that's in all phases. When you think about student loans, who borrows, who defaults, who's struggling, all that, um, policies and their failures and how that affects real people and could harm their lives, or even when it's beneficial to their lives. I think those stories are also important because again, you know, I, I see the mission of, of my coverage as keeping families informed about what it means to navigate higher ed, uh, the financial parts, especially um, as far as, as kind of COVID related stories. I'm always really curious to make sure that, or to make sure that we are thinking about the full ecosystem of what higher education means. The faculty, the staff, the janitors, the custodians, the dining service people, the students, how all of those people are affected by decisions that are made by the university, outside of the university, and what that means to their lives. So like I did a story about um, how faculty felt about coming back to campus. I'm working on one that is talking about how custodians and all those folks feel about coming back to campus and what their fears are. And then also grad students. I mean, you don't think about them as being a part of the workforce, but they are teaching and research assistants. And just how uh, all those stakeholders are gonna gonna fare when these schools reopen in whatever way and fashion that they choose to reopen. This is the problem with going last with these brilliant ladies. They, they, they're they taking all the good stuff. You guys are amazing. Yeah, it's it, same. I mean, definitely the policy and the accountability is so important, but students for me are like the main thing that I'm thinking about. So as I'm watching trends or things happen, it's like, what does this mean for students? So as colleges announce they're going to go online, what does that mean for folks who have already signed leases? Uh, where are they gonna be taking their classes? Kind of what does this mean for them, especially the pivot, you know, that, there's not a lot of time before move-in dates. So I'm, I'm always, whenever I'm kind of seeing things happen, I'm like, okay, what does this mean for the students? And of course, there are lots of different students. So I'm always trying to think kind of like, what are the students that I'm not thinking about, student parents or um, people who are working and doing other stuff, so. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask one more question of my own and then move to a few from, from the audience. Um, so I think this should be a little fun. These are rapid fire questions. For each prompt, attempt to reply with the fewest number of words possible, which I know um, might be a near impossible task for a group of women that are paid to write. So let's start with an easy one. Um, what's your favorite story you've written in the last few months? I'll go. Um, I learned a lot from a story that looked at student behavior and what we can, um, how schools can kind of enforce social distancing or to get students to maybe change the behavior in, which, in the, the world that they've already functioned in for several years. So I learned a lot about brain science and I want to know more. That's very cool. Uh, mine was not as cool, but <laughs> it was satisfying. I wrote about, um, debt collection, private debt collection lawsuits and called up a bunch of lenders and asked them why they were still suing people in the middle of a mm -hmm. pandemic when folks were losing their jobs. And they, they said, okay, we'll stop. 
I don't know if it was because of me. I, I you know, I want to think that. I really want to think that. But <laughs> it was satisfying to call one of my subjects and say, hey, I got this company to say mm. that they're going to stop harassing you. And please let me know if they start harassing you again, because I want to be sure to hold them accountable to what they told me. So that was satisfying. That's so cool. Um, when all of the schools basically went online in the spring, um, I followed a four college leaders and sort of tried to live moment by moment in making that decision and what they were weighing and what the human moments were. Um, and I think that, you know, gave me a, a little bit more perspective as to like what, where leaders were and where their heads were at, um, in a really stressful, stressful moment. Thank you. If you weren't covering the education beat, what issue would you be writing about? And if education, like you live and die on education, you can say that too, you're amongst friends. Maybe health. The thing I like about journalism is the people. Um, and so some of the, the cross section of our reporting about education has always kind of touched on health, like whether it's asthma in schools or kind of, you know, other tangential things. So I think health would be it. Um, I actually really am interested in racial wealth disparities. Uh, I'm a history nerd. I'm married to a historian. And I, I think a lot about how generational disparities have brought us to where we are now. And also think about that in the context of student debt and racialized student debt. So that's kind of where my heart is at. Still, still education related, though, in the end, just not at the beginning. Um, I think I would probably cover um, housing or transportation. Um, I think things that impact everybody, but there are so many incredible stories and I love reading coverage of those two areas. Who is an up and coming journalist we should be paying attention to? So I have to shout out my colleagues at the paper, my two newest colleagues, uh, Lauren Lumpkin and Hannah Natson. I think they're awesome journalists. I think they're ones to watch. Uh, Hannah covers K-12, Lauren covers higher ed, and they are worth a read all the time. Thank you. Um, I also have two. Um, Zipporah Osei works at ProPublica, and she writes a great newsletter on first-gen students. Um, and my colleague, Megan Zanies, covers higher ed with me at the Chronicle, and she is just an ace reporter and um, great, great to work with. Um, okay, so I was going to shout out Lauren because I tried to hire her as an intern on NPR Ed, and she went to the Post, so Lauren Lumpkin, definitely follow her. And she's doing a great job on higher ed stuff right now, which is really fun to watch. Um, and then Donnie Perez at, um, I think he's at Politico now. He used to be at the Chicago Tribune. Um, and he covers education. He's great. I love those. Thank you. Okay, last of these rapid fire, and then I'll move to a very robust audience q and I can see all the questions coming in. Um, what's the oddest pitch you've ever received? <laughs> I received recently a pitch for um, basically like an e-escort service that was going to be offered to NBA players who were kind of doing their season, you know, how they're all tight together in the season. <laughs> um, as colleges were rolling out their plans, um, I don't know if this is ever, but definitely in the last four months, I got a pitch about pillows that kill viruses. Um, <laughs> Amazing. In a similar vein, I got a pitch about uh, scanners that kill viruses and how they could be installed in uh, dorms along with HVAC systems that apparently help with the system. I don't know. I, I, I squinted and then I deleted. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like the right response. Um, okay, let's move to a few questions from our audience. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm hearing a number of faculty members are less than helpful on the front, like Danielle mentioned. They're upset about financial cutbacks, they don't want a greater workload, and so on. Might this be a tipping point on tenure? For anyone that wants to answer. I think, um, 
you know, and my colleagues cover issues of shared governance and tenure a little bit more closely than I do. But from what I hear and from, from what I read from them, um, I think if there are going to be trends on tenure and percentage of faculty, um, you know, lines that have tenure and those that are more lectures or adjunct based, I think it would be far more attributed to just the economic crisis that colleges are in right now. Um, I think we've been seeing um, a lot of move toward temporary appointments and um, contingent faculty for a long time. Um, and I think the challenges with state appropriations and uncertain enrollment, um, that'll be a big revenue challenge for colleges. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's something that I would keep an eye on as it relates to, you know, tenure and, and who gets it and who is offered it and the like. Yeah, I just kind of echoing what Lindsay said, there aren't a whole lot of tenure slots as is. And a lot of that has been taken up by contingent faculty for economic reasons, at least that's what colleges say, um, that has eroded shared governance in a lot of ways. And I think you're seeing that play out now at a lot of schools as uh, professors are saying they don't necessarily want to come back and not have to disclose any kind of medical information uh, in order to get a waiver from teaching in person. Uh, you're seeing that fight play out at places where they have unions and places where they don't. I certainly think that the economic struggles that a lot of schools are going to face are just going to heighten what was already an existing problem. And I think that's going to be a common theme for a lot of schools. This uh, health crisis is just going to intensify economic struggles and other sorts of struggles and debates that were occurring at their college campuses previously. Um, okay, let's see. Um, the next question comes from Phil Martin at EdTrust. What do you think is missing from the public conversation about who has access to higher ed, how much it costs, and who pays? Where are the experts and regular people out of sync? So I first, hey, Phil, <laughs> good, to, good to see you're on here. Um, first, I, I will say this, I am very hopeful in this space and in this moment that understandings of who pays and who suffers from the cost of higher education is becoming far more clear. I think people are talking about the racialized nature of student debt far more than they were, say, six years ago when I started covering this space. And I think that we're having meaningful conversations about how uh, debt forgiveness could potentially contribute to uh, helping to close, even though that's probably very difficult, the racial wealth gap, and how that could help Black students in particular. So, so we're getting there. The, the interest is there. The stories are there. Perhaps there needs to be more of those to raise awareness. There are still people who have really odd, faulty assumptions about uh, low-income students go to school for free more often than not, even though a lot of them end up with quite a bit of debt. So whatever we can do in that space to uh, deconstruct those myths and really un help people understand what's happening would be a service. I also think, you know, you think about where students and families get their information about college, and it's often in their own communities, at church, from their counselor, and I feel like those spaces, if they have a counselor, from, or even like an English teacher, you know, they get it from high school and they get it from their community. And so I think sometimes we forget about those spaces as like the main information source for them, and here we are over in Washington, or even with the media and um, think tanks, and we forget that like actually people are getting the stuff from over here. Um, so for us, you know, we're always trying to think, at least at NPR, if, if they're listening, how do we make this conversation make sense for what their world is, what they're looking at? But I think it's like something that we just forget in general, you know, that those are the spaces we need to be in. Um, okay, let's see. A bunch of questions. Oh, okay. I really like this one. Um, is there any insight or planned coverage about the impact on local economies for college towns, specifically thinking about HBCU homecomings that bring so much revenue into small towns once annually? Do, do mun municipalities have plans to mitigate that potential loss? 
this is this is something that I've been um, reading about actually in a lot of college papers and um, other outlets in the last couple of weeks. I think there's a really, I mean, it's a really uncomfortable and, and hard tension between the costs of bringing students back and the co the costs of keeping them away. Um, there, you know, the economic concerns of. Um, college towns who don't have thousands and thousands of students around those are those are real concerns but if students aren't taking health measures safely and the campus is becoming a hot spot um, you know that also is devastating and could cause um, economic shutdowns could cause health crises um, and so the town gown relationships between campuses and their communities. Um, you know, I think in a couple of places, um, you've seen um, local officials push back and, and express concern about college reopening plans. And I think that's, that tension is really driving it. I think it was interesting that in the spring, you saw uh, schools like I think it was Princeton, where they offered their local businesses that are right around the surrounding community loans or grants in order to continue to stay open while everything was going on. That's quite a wealthy school. I don't know if many other schools could afford that sort of, of generosity, but uh, there is a realization that these businesses will suffer if they don't have that population coming in, even as much as that might be a risk to their health. Let's see. Due to the uneven impacts of the virus on different groups of people in the US, some are speculating that there will be huge equity gaps along racial, ethnic, and or socioeconomic lines when it comes to enrollment. What have colleges been telling you about what they're actually seeing in terms of fall enrollment trends, if anything? I have found that folks are pretty tight-lipped about enrollment, mostly because I think they're just like crossing their fingers. I don't think they want to they don't want to talk about it quite yet. Um, on the student side, I mean, I've heard every every scenario that you could imagine for what they're planning to do in fall, whether it's staying enrolled and getting an apartment close to campus, even though they're shut down, it's taking a semester off, it's working, it's delaying enrollment. I mean, I've heard it's transferring back to, to the school where they're from so they can live at home and take classes locally. I mean, I've heard almost every response from students. So I have been like refreshing my email for National Student Clearinghouse data on enrollment. Um, I am I so excited for enrollment data. What do you, I do, have you guys tried differently? Are people talking about what they expect? I think um, what I've seen is sort of here are projections, here's what's off from them so far, here's sort of where we're headed toward fall. I, I mean, that sort of data on, you know, is it mostly low income students um, that they've seen attrition from and the like, um, I definitely haven't seen any of that yet and would be fascinated to see um, what is actually happening and how bad summer melt is um, for that reason. I think there was a study from EAB, maybe, um, that looked at about half a million um, from their members, from their member colleges. They looked at folks who had, um, maybe they accept, said the FAFSA, but then not enrolled. Is this, is this right? Is that, maybe I'm, <laughs> um, but I would look at EAB's most recent report, I think it came out a week ago, and they had some pretty big gap of folks who said they were actually going to show up in the fall. Um, by race. So that might be worth looking at if you're interested in that. Thank you. Sorry, that was only like a half tidbit, but hopefully that'll no, be enough perfect. to get you there. It's just enough. Um, okay. As we move into August, do you feel that stories and pitches still need to have a genuine COVID hook or connection to deserve having a story written about them? Kind of separately um, but related, do you feel the hook is in any way overused or even abused to get attention? I know I don't require a COVID hook because accountability is keying for me, but um, certainly for editors <laughs> because this is still the story of the moment that is that is important, but so is issues about the racial reckoning. I think anything in, the, in those two spaces 
uh, get the most attention and the most eyes. But since I do have some autonomy in, in, as to what I write, if again, it fits within keeping people informed about what will make it easier for them to navigate the space, then I'm willing to write about it. Um, I, I'll be honest, like there are, I have not really written any stories based off of a pitch in years. Sometimes I, I collect them in a folder. Mm -hmm. And if I start to see trends from them and from what I'm hearing um, from my own interviewing, coupled with what I'm being pitched, then it's worth more investigation. But I, pitches don't usually do it for me. Well, I would say that um, I haven't written any stories that weren't COVID related, actually, except for today, which is something totally unrelated about high school plays and musicals. But um, so I'll just like whatever I'm about to say about no COVID connection, you know, that, keep that in mind that I haven't written anything non related. But I think when you're pitching, like let the journalists do the stuff in their brain to make those connections. Right? I don't need like every pitch I get starts with COVID 19. I'm like, yeah, I know that it's going on. So <laughs> I think just get to like the meat of what it is, you know, like the new thing or whatever. Um, and I, can, I, I get that it's connected to COVID. So we're about a minute over time, but there's a great question coming from Kelly Mae Ross at NCAN that I think is perfect to end on. There's so much terrible stuff in the news right now. What's something that's giving you hope? And this does not have to be higher ed specific. Um, well, this is a little bit higher ed related, but it can be. <laughs> um, I was reporting on a story, um, you know, about a month or so ago and um, tuned into a Zoom meeting with students who were talking, you know, about this moment in activism for them and just the energy that they had bouncing off each other um, and, you know, how they were talking about communicating during this time and like making time for things that really mattered. Um, I felt like that sort of energy and, and passion was, was really um, inspiring and um, cool to see play out, you know, live on Zoom. Um, and just wanted to add to thank you so much for, for having us today and, and doing this conversation. I, I'm finding the most inspiration in the K-12 space. I am just in awe of these awesome teachers who are going the extra mile to mm -hmm. help their students feel connected. I, I think that's really sweet. You know, I um, have the utmost respect for teachers and it's just wonderful to see more stories about all the amazing things that they do and them getting the recognition for it. And thank you for having us today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it's been really fun to watch, you know, I just gave a shout out to this high school plays and musicals piece, but I think it's been really fun to watch just students connect over um, with music, with, you know, kind of over social media, and just to watch kind of the importance of human connection translate into the digital space. That's been really amazing. Like, I love that we get to talk to kids and to um, young adults every day. It's the best part of, part of this job. Well, on that, we will close. Alyssa, uh, Lindsay, and Danielle, thank you all so much for carving out uh, your precious time for joining us this afternoon. Um, we look forward to continuing to follow your incredible coverage um, of higher ed, both now and in the future. And to all of you, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, see you on the other side. Thanks so much. Take care.